and ask those who are going to be speaking here this morning to come up and sit in the choir loft up here. Our um, mission statement here at Calvary reads like this, to make disciples through the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to build up and equip each believer by means of the truth of God's word, and to be a community of true fellowship, passionate prayer, and worldwide impact. Grace, truth, community. I think oftentimes we don't really understand what grace is. Grace is something that is beyond our comprehension. And yet grace is something that each and every one of us benefit from. Grace is indescribable. God's grace. The fact that you're here this morning is because of the grace of God. And no matter where you are in your Christian life, no matter where you are in your walk, whether you're a a believer that's been following Christ for 50 years, or someone who just met Jesus last week, grace is equally measured in each and every one of your lives. In fact, the cool thing about grace is grace levels the playing field, and it exalts Jesus. And as you think about that, no matter where you are, no matter who it is that God allows you to cross paths with, you are living, you are existing, you are benefiting from the amazing grace of God. But at the center of that, Jesus is exalted. It's all because of him. It's not because of anything you've done. Secondly, truth. Truth is, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Jesus is truth. His word is truth. So we think about the word of God. The word of God is our standard. It's, it's, our, it's our, our beacon. It's our roadmap. It's, the, it's the, the living word of God that we go to to get our direction, to, get our, to set our sights, and to launch us to where he would have us to go. But you remember Jesus said, I am the truth. So once again, Jesus is exalted in the truth. And then community. When Adam was created in the garden, God said it's not good that he's alone. He gave him Eve. And then he told him to go out and to to multiply. And then when, when Jesus came here to this earth, he surrounded himself with 12 disciples. And as he left, Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples community. You can't do it on your own. You are not built, you have not been created to exist on your own. You've been created to exist in a community. And that community is represented here by the family of God, by Calvary Baptist Church. So as you hear what's being said this morning, as you hear what's being shared from all of these leaders of various ministries, I want you to remember to keep those things at the forefront of your mind. We've got them, we've got them on the walls around here. We've got them uh, sometimes in the bulletin. We've got them in, in, in manuals and all that kind of stuff. But grace, truth, and community. And in every one of those things, Christ is central. Christ is exalted. We as a body of believers are to be Christ-like ones so that when people look at us, what they see is Jesus and he's lifted up. As for these various ministries are shared with you, I want to encourage you to think about how God would have you to get involved in the process of exalting Jesus and making disciples. So we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on this time, and then you're going to hear from the various uh, people involved in these ministries. Let's pray together. Father, we... um, we are awed once again at the opportunity you've given us to be about your work. God, we confess that oftentimes what we do is we get involved in what we call church work, and it's all about us, and it's not about you. So, Father, our desire is today as we, um, as we share from our hearts what we believe you would have us to do, God, may it once again be contagious, and may it be that Jesus is, is exalted. But God, most of all, we ask that you would meet with us today, that you would be pleased with what's set forth, and that you would prosper it. And God, we thank you for each and every person in this room. 
We thank you for this community that you've given to us, for the opportunity we've been given to encourage one another and to pray for one another and to, to love one another and to exhort one another. God, may that be done today to your honor and to your glory. So we commit this time to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everybody. Um, if you're new here, let me introduce myself. My name is Matt Hareen. I'm the student pastor, youth pastor here at the church, and so I know you're going to be seeing several people up here, so I just want to uh, just be friendly and let, uh, introduce myself to you so you know who I am. Um, primarily, my role here at the church is with students, uh, junior high through high school. Uh, although I do have the privilege, and I, I absolutely consider it a privilege to oversee or be involved in a number of other different ministries, so today I am going to talk about student ministry, but I'm also going to be highlighting several other different ministries. I, I have maybe my hand in a little bit, but ways for you to get plugged in, involved, pray for these ministries, and uh, just to know what's going and what's ahead of ourselves in 2013. Um, before I even get started, I do want to highlight these, these dates again for our mission trips, at least the two that have been mentioned uh, so far this morning. The New York trip, again, is, is July 21st through the 27th, and so just so you guys have those dates already in your mind, 21st through the 27th of July. And then the Copper Island trip, the, pl the plan is for us to be out there the week of June 22nd through the 29th. Uh, so those are the weeks that we're looking for, at least for those two mission trips. And so I know there's going to be at least one or two others mentioned here that are going to be going on throughout the summer, but those are the two that have been highlighted. So mark your calendars, pray about those uh, different trips and how you can get plugged in, go or send somebody uh, on one of those trips. All right, um, let me get started here with student ministry. So I'm just going to be, there's no way to transition from ministry to ministry, so just bear with me. Uh, as we talk about student ministry, uh, one of the things I've been doing with, with the students, especially this year, is really highlighting our, our mission statement with, with the teens and what, what we're all about, why we exist. Our mission statement as a student ministry goes like this. Our mission is to see the gospel renew all things for the glory of God and the joy of all people. That is, that is our mission. And so more than I want to stand up here and just say, here's an event we have planned, here's an activity we have planned, here's a, another program we have planned, I would much rather spend time this morning highlighting and focusing on the mission and the reason for why we do what we do. If we don't know why we exist as a ministry, if we don't know why we exist as a church, then who cares what we do if we don't understand What's pushing us to do those things? So again, uh, what we're trying to just hammer into the, the, the minds and the hearts of these teens is that our mission, even though they're junior hires and high schoolers, they have a tremendous impact in this community, in their schools, uh, and, and around the world, and it starts now, but their mission is to see the gospel renew all things for the glory of God because it's all about him and for the joy of all people. So that's what we're trying to constantly put into uh, their minds, why we do what we do. The whole emphasis behind our ministry is, is to live life on mission. So with that being said, there are some things that are happening this year, some things that we are extremely excited about that are on the horizons for the student ministry. So let me uh, just highlight a couple of those. Um, we, we are being able to remodel our youth room down there, which I'm extremely excited about because it is giving the teens a space of their own. Um, I, to be honest, and, and the teens know I say this all the time, I could care less about the room. It's what happens outside of those walls that matters. Uh, but this is exciting because it's giving them a place that's theirs for us to gather, to worship together, and then to go out from there and to uh, be impacts for the kingdom of God. But but the room remodel is just going to be an incredible opportunity for us to continue to live life on mission. And so some of the ideas we have planned for our, our new room remodel is to um, have it open throughout the week. So after school, students can come. They can, they can spend some time down there with, with some other adults. They can do homework and just, just be together, create a little bit of community there, invite friends to come on over here uh, that go to other high schools, and just have an opportunity for us to possibly build relationships with other teens that are even outside of our, our ministry. So again, just a simple room remodel, we want to always look at it as, okay, what's, how can we go bigger with this? So it's not just about us, because um, I'll tell them all the time, listen guys, this, is, this ministry is not about you, okay? It's about Christ, and how can we make him known in every single area of our lives? So even with a simple room remodel, we want to make sure that Christ is glorified and made known in that. And so those are some ideas we have with our, with our new room. It's not done yet, so don't go in there. It is a mess. You'll be sadly disappointed if you went down there this morning. Uh, so 
couple weeks, you can check that out. Um, we are doing some mission trips, as you've been hearing this, this morning even. Uh, Copper Island will be something that is pushed. Uh, I've been pushing it with them for the last couple uh, of months, just mentioning it to them. And so now that, that Ray was here today, which was just perfect timing uh, for him to really just highlight it, uh, we're going to be full force kicking that off, but we're also opening that up to uh, the whole church and so different areas where you can get plugged in there. Uh, we will be going to New York uh, again, possibly this summer, uh, fall trip, doing some different mission trips there. Uh, but then even, I know I'm jumping the gun here, but 2014, we're already looking at going to Haiti uh, and just visiting our missionaries there and taking a group of teens to Haiti. So there's some mission trips that we want to uh, highlight. We want to have our teens have a global perspective uh, to truly see what God is doing around the world, that God isn't just the God of America, but that he is active and moving in every tribe, tongue, and language. And so we want to expose the teens to as much as that as we possibly can. So global missions is obviously an emphasis for us. But not only that, but also local outreach, local missions. Um, we, we want to work at Salvation Army here in town to, to, to minister to those in our own community that are hurting. And so we already have a couple dates here coming up in June and July to be sending teens there and, and just serving others to just empty themselves of themselves and reach out to other people who, who are in need. And so we go to Salvation Army here in our town. Uh, we'll be working with Orlando Ministries here uh, just up the street, um, the, the apartment complex there. Our idea is to uh, just hone in on that apartment complex and get to know the family families, the kids there, uh, and just to minister and really build relationships with the goal of living life on mission, with the goal of seeing Christ and seeing the gospel renew all things. And so we want to have local outreach there in our own backyard. Um, summer sports camps. Uh, those of you that were involved with those last year, this is a, a student-led ministry, but we cannot do it without the help of so many of you. So again, thank you for helping out last year, and I'm going to need you again this year. Um, last year we had around 300 kids kids that went through uh, the summer sports camps through soccer or basketball throughout the summer and and my gut feeling is is we're going to have that many again if not more um, and so we are really going to need um, everybody that can participate everybody that can can help out that can serve that can give that can pray for these uh, these camps as we do them all throughout the summer uh, just to, to give you a heads up the month of April I'm gonna stand up here again and give you guys an itemized list of here's supplies that we need to make this work. We need basketball hoops, basketball, soccer, soccer balls, net, I mean just all these different things and it, it, it adds up and so our plan is already in, in April to take that month and, and raise the money that we need so that when June comes, week one, we're, we're hitting the ground running and not wondering where we're going to get our next supplies. And so uh, be in prayer for that. Let me know already if you want to be a part of that. I will take your name now. That's such a huge outreach that we have that the students will be living and, and leading out. Uh, but more than programs, again, like I said, more than just programs that we're trying to implement with the teens is our emphasis is that this is how we should just be living like, like when we go to New York on the, on the New York trip this past fall, I don't know how many times I stood up before the teens and said, listen, th this is how we should be living all the time, sharing our faith, living the gospel out in word and deed, and now we just get to go do that same thing in New York. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it should be a lifestyle. So programs, events, outreach opportunities, these are just outlets for us to to practice what we're already doing. And so that's one of the areas that we are constantly trying to implement and, and teach the teen. So, so please pray for the student ministry. Uh, pray for our leaders. We have incredible amount of leaders, incredible leaders that have a, a, a profound love uh, for the teens, and they do a fantastic job. So please pray for us. Uh, pray for me as I continue to, to preach. I promise you this, parents in here, I will, I will teach uh, faithfully the word. Um, I will make the gospel central in everything that we do, but we need your prayers. We have uh, teens that absolutely love Christ and are on fire for him, and we have teens that want nothing to do with him but just gather because it's a social event. And I love them all, and we want to see Jesus move mightily in the hearts of every single one of them, but we need you as a church to rally around these students, to care for them, to love them, to be excited about them, and to push them and encourage them in everything that we're doing. And so, so please pray for us in the student ministry. I'm jumping to another ministry here, and, I'll, and these next couple ones I'll, I'll hit very quickly. 
but with our care ministry. Uh, care ministry is the ministry that, that reaches out to uh, those in our own community for, for uh, those that call our churches that are in need of rental assistance, utility bills, whatever it may be, and they just ha- don't have a job. They don't um, have any money to make ends meet, and so for whatever reason, their, their last resort oftentimes is to call the church. Sadly, I would, I, I would rather the church be their first resort uh, rather than government agencies and things like that. I would rather them see the church being the, the, the plan A, uh, and so what we do is when they come through, Steve Swope and I have just uh, built a really incredible relationship over the last year to really hone in on this ministry and develop it, and, and how can we see the gospel again renew all things? How can we be about grace, truth, and community in the care ministry? And so uh, it, it's been tweaked. It's been wor- We have a very good system for uh, people that call in. Uh, I don't need to go through all that. We've mentioned that before, but, but I know you, so many of you give every month to this ministry, so thank you. Um, thank you for giving to that ministry. It has an incredible, incredible impact. Just a couple weeks ago, uh, we had a lady um, call our church, and she wasn't needing anything. We've helped her out in, in the past, and she just wanted to call to say thank you. Um, she's like, you know, I, I don't know if I said thank you last time uh, you guys helped me. So I just woke up this morning and just said, I need to give them a call and just say thank you for uh, the church being generous and helping. Um, she said that there was a, a friend of hers that was asking her recently how she had gotten out of the slump that she was in. And, and, and she says, man, I was able just to, to brag about Calvary. And again, I don't want it to be about us whatsoever, but, but we're having an impact and so that was just such an encouragement to hear from her just saying, this church cared for me. It took time to meet with me. And she was able to share that with another friend just about the, the generosity of this local body. So I, I want to um, commend you for that and continue to, to plead with you to pray for that ministry as well. Pray for the coach, coaches that meet with people. It is a frustrating job. It really is. And they do it with grace and humility. So um, one thing we have on the horizon for the care ministry this year is, is to not just meet individually with with people, but to offer quarterly budget seminars that's free of charge to those in our community where people can come in on a Saturday morning for three to four hours to, to sit down and hear how to plan a budget and then have breakout sessions where they can really detail different areas that they struggle with, whether it be resume building, whether it be just searching for a job, whether it be interview skills, whether it be um, using some of the gifts that you guys are really good at, couponing. There's some people in this room that are crazy, crazy couponers. That can be a gift used to further the gospel. We have you come and, hey, we're going to teach people in our community how to save money in this way, to be thrifty, um, all sorts of different things. So, so to have a quarterly meeting where it's just free to the, the neighborhood, free to the community, where people can come in here and just learn and have us invest time into their lives. And so those are some things that are on the horizon for this year that you'll be hearing about um, shortly in, in the weeks and months to come. Um, one other ministry here is our special needs ministry, and, and I don't need to spend much time on this one, but it, it is going to be an outreach to new parents in our town. Uh, the Mark First Center here in town that, that specializes in, in children with special needs, I've been in touch with them, uh, and, and they are going to now put information in all their packets um, that they send out to their parents uh, that, they, that they work with about our church and the special needs ministry that we have here. Uh, and, and so we might be getting some new, new parents, some new children coming to our church uh, because they know we have a special needs ministry that, that tailors it to them, to, that meets with kids with special needs and, and cares for them and, and loves them. And so um, my big push that I need for you guys today in this area of ministry is we need guy volunteers. Uh, because of the special nature of this ministry, we have to have a one-to-one ratio. So we can't have nine kids and two leaders and that's enough. We have to have one adult per kid. And, and so that puts a little bit more stress on, on, our, on our workers, on our volunteers. And, and we're in desperate need of male volunteers. We have one guy, Michael Levy, who is so faithful every single week, but he has not had a break in months um, because he, he's there faithfully every week. And he loves it. I was talking about this morning. He's like, I love this. And but I'm like, I, I need to give you a break or you're going to burn out. And he's like, I know, I know, I know. So, so guys, I know a lot of times we hear ministries like this and we automatically think that's, that's for ladies. I'm not gifted there. Yes, you are. You will be fantastic. So please, um, if you're interested in special needs, uh, especially you guys, will you please let me know? Shoot me an email. Call the church. Um, talk to me right afterwards, and we will get you hooked up. We'll get you to talk to Winnie Mole, who's overseas and does a fantastic job, and she'll let you know what the responsibilities are, really what it is. But it's really just just spending time with the kids and loving on them. That's what it is. And so it's not a, a huge responsibility, but be maybe once a month. So really consider that, really pray for that.
The last area I want to talk about, this isn't necessarily a, a ministry that I'm overseeing per se, but it's a ministry that I'm um, absolutely passionate about. And so I want to mention it this morning. That's our small group ministry. Um, I have so many things to talk about, and I'm just going to highlight a couple. The, small groups is not a new idea. I, I don't know if we maybe grasp that. It's, it's nothing new. It's, it's not something, hey, this is the newest trend. Let's, everybody else is doing it, so let's, let's do this. Um, Acts chapter 2, the, the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They met daily in the temple, and they met daily in, in people's homes. Like, they were passionate about community, as we were just talking about earlier this morning. So it's an area that, that it's nothing new. It's nothing that we're repackaging. It's not something that w- let's try and force people in this. Th- this isn't just a program that we're trying to get you to be a part of. It's, as I see it, a, a theme that runs throughout the entirety of the New Testament that's called upon of the, of the local church to be in fellowship with one another, deep-rooted, deep-seated love and fellowship with one another. W- God has reconciled us to himself in Christ and has now placed us in community with one another to, to war against sin, to pursue and push one another towards holiness, to encourage and love one another, to do life together on mission for the glory of God. We have not been saved to live life as a, as a solo project. It, you are not saved and, and put into a room by yourself, and God said, good luck with that. He saved us and placed us in community with one another to say, listen, there's still going to be ongoing sin in your life. There's still going to be areas where you're weak, where you, where you struggle, where you need the church, where you, where you need people that know you on a deep level to push you, to encourage you, and to confront you in your weaknesses. We need one another to encourage us in our strengths, to push us, to use those for the edification of the local church. But we also need people to know where our blind spots are, to know where we're weak, to know where we struggle, because there's not one person in this room that is free from the the effects of sin. Every single person in this room is is not immune to sin. We all struggle, and and, and sadly, we want to keep them secret, And, and the problem is that's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for your personal growth to, to keep sin str- to secret and hopefully just overcome it on your own. God has placed us in community to war together, to battle sin, to push one another towards holiness. We need it. It's vital for your spiritual health. It's vital for the health of the local church to be in community with one another. However, we struggle with really wanting others to know the real us. We struggle with that. What would people think if they really knew this about me? W- w- so often our struggle is we find our identity linked to what other people think of us rather than who Christ says that we are in him. That's, that's the problem that we face is I'm worried about what my neighbor will think of me if they know I struggle with this. Then rather the, the gospel freeing us from that and saying I'm accepted by the God of the universe not because of how awesome I am but because Christ stood in my place. And so there's not one person that would meet in a room that's immune from sin. Everyone's jacked up. That's the whole point of the cross. The whole point of the cross is that you are not good, that we needed a Savior. So, so can we let the gospel free us from that fear? Let the gospel free us from that, that hindrance of opening up to other people and just sharing. And I don't want the whole small group to just be us crying all the time. That's not what it is. It isn't that at all, man. It's encouragement. It's knowing where we're strong and pushing one another in that. But it's also having people that are right beside you that know, listen, the main goal is being like Christ, and we're going there together. And when you fall, I'm right there with you to push you, to confront you in grace and humility. That's small group ministry. That's, that's biblical. And so here's what I'd love to see in 2013, and I'll be done here. I would love to see our small groups double. That means we need more leaders. That means we, we need more locations. It, it puts a whole stress on us for what to do. I'm okay with that. Because I would rather have a church that's passionate about deep-seated love for one another and community and warring against sin and pursuing holiness than not. And so I would love to see our small groups double. I would love to see more of the older generation involved in our small groups. Here's why. The younger generation needs you. We need you to mentor us. We need you to disciple us. We need you to model to us what a godly husband and a godly father is. We need you to teach us and model to us what godly wives and godly mothers are. We need you to train us and show us and live the gospel out. So I would love to see some of the older generation getting involved more so in our small group ministry. And I would love to see the younger generation 
pursuing them as well and seeking out older godly men and women to mentor, to disciple. And, and small groups just provide an incredible outlet for that to happen. Okay, We know people here, but man, when we can break that up, transformation takes place, and that's, that's the goal of Christianity. So those are some of the areas that um, I'm excited about, that I'm, I'm wanting to see you get involved with this year in, in 2013. Any more questions that you have, please email me, please call me, um, see me afterwards, and I would love to just talk more and more uh, about these different areas of ministry with you. Thanks. Let me real quick introduce myself. I'm Pastor Mel Barth, uh, pastor of Children's and Family Ministries. And uh, I was jokingly told that I only had a minute and a half to share all this with you. This, that wasn't a joke. Okay, I'll talk real fast. All right, uh, we are just thrilled and excited that today is our kickoff Sunday for our children's ministry in the new uh, area that we have down there that uh, uh, we've newly renovated. And uh, it's just, just, I wish you could have been down there and seen the the excitement and the joy on those little faces as they came down and they found an area where they can call church and they can say this is where I do church. Um, we've had so many people help us with that I couldn't thank all of them but let me just say a quick thanks to John and Melissa Orns, Janine and uh, Jeremy Miller and Brian Bonnie Jackson who are part of our leadership team our volunteer leadership team. This has been a great opportunity for us to uh, partner with our parents uh, as they have helped us on Saturdays over the last uh, three months as we've uh, uh, renovated downstairs. And it's just a really exciting team uh, time. We're also assembling a um, curriculum team to look at uh, our curriculum and, and uh, uh, how we can best share the love of Jesus with our kids. Uh, we're starting the next uh, phase of SEAL training, which is our spiritually energized assistant leaders. Uh, rather than calling them junior church workers, uh, we thought we'd have a cool name like that. But uh, we're starting uh, our training once again with our, our next phase of that. Um, and it's just a joy uh, to be in a new place uh, to do what we uh, prioritize as the important thing is that is sharing the love of Jesus with these kids, seeing kids saved, seeing more kids baptized. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I got tickled and I got thrilled at the last baptism when Brooke came up out of the water. Of course, the water was hot for her and I had no idea what Brooke was going to do. Normally very quiet and she came up and went, woo! <laughs> And uh, that, that's the way we should be uh, about baptism and salvation. And so we're enjoying seeing that. Uh, at the same time, let me just say we could use some more workers. Uh, we could use some twos and threes workers. We could use some teachers, especially men teachers and our, our second and third grade boys and our fourth and fifth grade boys. Uh, and also some teens to come and be part of our, our SEALs training. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to come and be a part of the excitement that's going on downstairs. Now, we call it a kickoff Sunday uh, because this is just the start. We're not, we're not finished. There's still some things that we need to do. Uh, one of the things is put a roof on down there. And uh, I know you don't usually put a roof on a basement, but you'll figure it out in a couple months when you see what we're doing. Uh, but this is a kickoff. This is 14 years of dreams. Uh, finally coming together and, and giving our kids a place to be there. So come and be a part of that excitement. Come this morning and be a part of that excitement. Afterwards this morning, we invite you to come down and take a look at what God's done down there. Um, we have uh, a couple of cakes down there to uh, celebrate the, the situation. So if there's any cake left after the kids are done, when they get excited, they eat. Uh, then come and join us for that. But come and see what God's doing down there. Uh, God's also working in our Upwards program. Let me take a second and just thank uh, Joel Swanson and Amy Biernick for uh, their tireless, countless hours of work uh, with Upwards. But we've seen... Uh, we've been able to reach out to more people than we ever have this year. And uh, lots of things coming up. Uh, with our closing banquet, our closing rally and whatnot. We're doing a little different this year, so it's specialized to each kid. But we could use some more refs, too, at the same time. I'm going to become a broken record up here and say, come help us. But uh, we could use some more refs with that. Awana, Shannon, and Steve Stewart, uh, our commanders, have done a wonderful job down there. I, I thank them over and over. But uh, I was asking Steve, what can I say about Awana? And he said, well, interesting thing, in, in last year and this year, our boys are doing better than they ever have, especially our older boys uh, in 
finishing their books and memorizing their verses. I don't know that they're quite caught up with the girls yet, but uh, the boys are doing real well, and, that, and a lot of excitement there. But we have Awana games coming up. Uh, we have uh, Awana quizzing coming up and all kinds of exciting specialty nights uh, in Awana. As I move on, we're also starting a new small group this Wednesday night, Hope Keepers, which is a ministry to those that are chronically ill or caregivers of people that are going through a crisis. So if you're facing, it doesn't have to be cancer. Uh, it doesn't, it, it can be anything. Uh, on Wednesday nights at 6.15, starting this Wednesday night, we'll be up in the library ministering to those that are going, struggling through um, some of life's worst. And I, I thought it was interesting because as Ray said this morning, um, every day of life is a gift. There's some people up there that every day of life really is a gift. And so we're doing our best to reach out to them. Uh, we have some mission trips coming up. Uh, uh, with Carol Campbell taking our school kids down to Jeff Wallers, which is a ministry to children in Texas, um, and also Ryan Brown trying to recruit men to go down and help uh, do some, install some lights and stuff down there at Jeff Wallers Place in Texas. If you're interested in that, contact Ryan and, and be a part of that. Um, I'm one of the new members on the missions committee, so let me take a second to thank Jack Archibald for his work in there uh, with that committee, but uh, Jack was telling me some neat ideas. One of the things he was thinking of is we would love to have some couples or families to go out and do some uh, mission trips either by themselves or with another couple and just get to know a missionary on their field. Get to know their field. You can be a blessing to that missionary. You can be a blessing to the church as you come back and become an ambassador for that field. Come back and tell us uh, what you learned and, and, and let us share the, the passion that you have from being there. A great example is, is uh, the Wideners who just came back from the mission field and we'll hear from them soon on that, but uh, uh, a great blessing for you. The other thing is, is uh, when I joined uh, the missions committee, I didn't realize that they have a discretionary fund of about $2,000 that they use for missions. And uh, so I thought, well, well, I should share some of that with you so you can see what's going on. Last year, what uh, the missions committee did with the money that they gave out, they gave $400 dollars to uh, Holly Cromie for her trip uh, for CEF trip to children we gave $250 to the piles for a special project we gave $100 to Abu Ali's for their son's graduation and we gave $35 at the end of the year to all of our missionaries as a special Christmas gift so uh, your faith promise dollars are not just uh, going to everyday things but also special projects. And, and uh, if you have ideas, let the missions committee know for that, uh, about that too. Uh, and finally, um, I'd ask you for your prayers uh, and your support for our addiction ministries as we minister those to our, are struggling with some very, very tough things. And uh, please let us know, uh, let me know if you have referrals, if you have somebody that you know that is struggling with uh, an addiction uh, so that we can help bring them to the Lord and, and help uh, them get victory over that. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, following precedent, I'll introduce myself. My name is George Rutherford, though honestly, if you get me confused with these other fellows, I invite you to in go to your optometrist sometime really soon. <laughs> pastor didn't tell me how much time I had, uh, and I don't have a watch, so this may take a while. <laughs> I'm here representing the Pastoral Search Committee. Uh, the members are uh, myself, Steve Stewart, who is our chairperson, uh, Ken DeVore, Rob Hogus, Brian Jackson, and Mark Smith. Uh, Mark Smith, although he's uh, not on the deacon board, he was invited to be on the committee because of his considerable experience in helping churches find pastors. Uh, when the committee first got together, uh, I was greatly encouraged that the first thing we decided to do was just to meet for prayer uh, for uh, every day for the first week. We met at six o'clock in the morning down here in the upper fireside room. And now we meet weekly on Thursdays. Uh, we meet again at six in the morning for a time of prayer and then later in the evening uh, to conduct the business of the search. Uh, folks, I cannot tell you how encouraged I am to hear these men pray. Uh, these are men of, of different ages and different outlooks, but they are 
genuinely seeking God's guidance and they are wanting to pour themselves out, to, to push themselves down, to let God do the leading and uh, that encouraged me greatly. Uh, I hope there's a PowerPoint slide here somewhere. Uh, I'm just here to tell you a little bit about how the search process will go. Now, mind you, the best laid schemes of mice and men, so don't feel too uh, terrible if uh, things get changed a little bit as we go, but this is how we see the process going. Uh, the first step is just to gather uh, church information. Now, that's pretty much uh, already in the works. We're using, uh, uh, well, we're, we're getting, <laughs> thankfully, the help of folks on the church staff to help us just gather facts about the church because when uh, you find candidates who might want to pastor here, they're going to want to know about your church. So we need a, a uh, piece of information to give them so that they know how many people attend, uh, what sort of age groups you have, how many Sunday school classes, uh, how many pastors have you had, how long have they stayed, those kinds of things. So that is sort of step one. It's already going on in the background. Uh, step two, we're working on even now, we're gathering uh, a, a number of views in order to identify, A, where the church has strengths and weaknesses, and then uh, to identify the sort of qualities in a new pastor that might help us leverage those strengths and to bolster those weaknesses. Now, uh, the committee recognizes that the qualifications for pastor are found in scripture, and we are reading over and over uh, in our private time the letters to Timothy and Titus so that those things are right in the forefront of our minds. But we will be uh, asking different ones. We will be putting together a questionnaire for the congregation so that you can help us identify what areas you think Calvary uh, is strong in, what areas you think Calvary might need some help in, and then what sort of qualities you would expect to see in a new pastor. So that will be coming soon. Uh, then the next step, of course, is to acquire uh, names and, and resumes for candidates. Uh, I know that some of you have already talked to members of the committee and suggested a name or two. We're not quite at that stage yet, but when we get there, we will invite you and uh, anyone else and other friends of the church to give us names of possible candidates. Uh, we'll also contact uh, seminaries, Bible colleges. Uh, we may do some, uh, some targeted advertising just so that we can make sure that uh, the, the right people know that there is an opening here so that uh, God can begin to work on them too. Then, of course, uh, once we get uh, resumes and information, uh, part of that information, of course, will involve uh, sending them a questionnaire so that we can uh, probe and see uh, about their doctrine, uh, about their personal walk with the Lord, about their families, uh, once we get all that information in, then the evaluation uh, will proceed. The committee will uh, prayerfully consider all of the information given to us. Uh, and then, of course, as we narrow the list down to a few prime candidates, we will uh, quite likely go and, and uh, perhaps hear them preach in their home church. Uh, with the web these days, you can always get uh, podcasts or webcasts of, of sermons so that we know uh, how these people present the Word of God. Then uh, eventually uh, the, uh, the committee will make a unanimous choice. Uh, that is a constitutional requirement that the, the choice to bring a candidate to the church uh, must be unanimous in the committee. The, the candidate will be invited uh, here to the church. He will meet with the deacon board. He will meet with you. Uh, his family, of course, uh, will come with him so that you get an idea of, of what this person is like. And then after you get a chance to get to know him and hear him preach, then uh, there will be uh, a vote where uh, there will be a notice of at least a week before the vote. And then uh, in order to call a pastor, the, our Constitution requires that at least 75% of those present and voting uh, must vote in favor of calling the candidate. And uh, our Constitution also requires that uh, only one candidate uh, can be considered at a time. So it's not like the typical corporate search where you bring in three or four people and then you look at all of them and then you uh, decide among the three or four. So that's the, uh, how we see the process going. Uh, we invite you to begin already, if you're not already, I know some of you already are, pray with us. Uh, we really covet your prayers because this is one of those areas where uh, if, if the, the church uh, doesn't get behind us and help us to pray, uh, a 
progress is going to be hard to make. We really want to hear God speak. We want his guidance to be so clear that the choice will be obvious for us and there won't be, uh, there won't be any need for us to discuss very much. So please pray with us and for us and uh, we will keep you updated on our progress as time goes by. I'm the last person to speak this morning about this, and then, then we'll sing a song, and pastor will come and bring a message. I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Isaac Judd. I see most of you every Sunday morning, so you probably already know who I am, but that's my introduction. I'm Isaac Judd, and I'm the music director here. <coughs> During this past week, um, and actually a few weeks prior to this, we've been talking in our um, meetings about what our mission statement is for our church. To be honest with you, when I um, over the past years, year and a half that I've been here, I don't know that I had ever actually heard our mission statement. And so when I heard it in the past couple of weeks, I was um, I was very encouraged, and I started thinking. Now, how is the music ministry fitting into this mission statement? Because you know that's the goal of a mission statement is that you should align all your ministries and your focus and the things that you do to be fulfilling that mission statement. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, the three bullet points of the mission statement and then I'll sort of close. The first bullet point in our mission statement is grace. Our music here should always proclaim God's grace. Our music should do that so much so that by the time that you, the message and the sermon comes around, your mind is already focused on the grace, the love, and the greatness of our God. It's through that um, singing and worshiping together about the grace of our Lord, that's what will draw us together into community. That is the third bullet point, so I'm doing one and then three. Community is the third bullet point. It talks, um, we've talked together about, you know, coming together and singing and how that is something that is extremely communal building. If you remember probably six months ago, I had everyone sort of crunch together and sing. A lot of people said, Isaac, that was just so neat. I, it wasn't really planned. It was just sort of fly by night. But the idea was, um, that that's something that's lacking in our culture and even in our churches today is this idea of community. And I really believe that music and singing together and worshiping together will promote community. I also think that small groups is important for that also. Thank you, Matt, for uh, saying that also. The last one is truth. Our music should always be rooted in doctrinal truth and faithfulness to scripture. I'm very, very careful about when I pick music, picking songs that are doctrinally correct and faithful to scripture. I don't just pick songs that I like. I don't just pick songs that are, you know, top things that you're hearing in Christian music these days. I really do carefully evaluate them. If you ever think that you hear something in a song that may be doctrinally questionable, please come talk to me about it, and I will consider it. I will set you straight. Not really. <laughs> no, really, I, I, I do encourage you, and people have come and asked me questions before, and I appreciate that. I think that that is important, and it's part of your responsibility as well as mine. When I, when I started focusing on these three bullet points, you know, grace, truth, and community, it started sounding very familiar to a passage of scripture that relates to music. In fact, it is Quite frequently, it's like the prime um, example of musical scripture that music people go to. That was not very <laughs> clearly said. But basically, if, if you come and ask a question about music, uh, the text most music directors will take you to is Colossians 3.16. That verse says, what does it say? Let the word, I do know it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, within that verse, there's grace, there's truth, and there's community. So, it just, it works out really well. So great job, whoever decided on the mission statement of our church. I think it's very true to biblical standards. And I want to now, um, looking forward to this next year, I want to see how we can take Colossians 3.16, that verse, and apply it to us as a body of believers here at Calvary. I think it's extremely timely what Ray Badgerow was talking about, about this idea, this virus that he has noticed affecting um, um, 
all believers and all Christian, um, all Christianity. It's this, this virus of entitlement. I see it extremely prevalent in music. He mentioned it. I did not pay him to say that. In fact, he kind of took me aback when he said that because it helps me to know that maybe it's not just in the circles that I've been in that I've noticed it, but maybe that this really is a virus and an epidemic that's sweeping across America, this idle idea of entitlement. And you know what? He said it today. What is the cure for entitlement? For this gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude is exactly the cure for it. And that's what um, the end of Colossians 3.16 says. In this upcoming year, I'm going to have a few little chats with you all, and we're going to unpack Colossians 3.16 together. We're going to find out what it means to sing, what it mean, what, how music relates to us as a body of believers, and how we can combat our ideas of entitlement when it comes to music. I'm really excited to have this service, this, I, this vision cast service. Um, it was really encouraging to me to hear each person talk this morning. My prayer for us is that our vision that we're casting, though, is not just our vision. I don't want to be Isaac's vision for music and Matt's vision for the youth and Mel's vision for the children and George's vision for the pastors. I think that it needs to, we need to constantly be in prayer and seeking the Lord's will so that our vision falls into line with his. I believe tr um, that the best ways to do that is through prayer and the reading of scripture. So, I don't know if I'm stealing Pastor Thunder. I hope I'm not. But just for a couple of minutes, I want us to take just a couple of minutes, and I want us to pray that our vision for our church for our church leaders, and for every direction of our church is one that is falling into line with Scripture, and that the Lord would reveal his vision for our church to us, that he would uh, do that through his Holy Spirit. I want to take a couple minutes. We'll do that silently. I'm going to play on the piano. Then we'll sing together the song, Be Thou My Vision. So would you just bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm not going to lead us. I just want you to take a couple minutes to pray for the Lord's vision for our church. <laughs> 